Welcome to our third genomics education programme linkage webinar. Really delighted to see so many people joining today. Um, today we'll be hearing about spinal muscular atrophy from Dr Louise Hartley, who I'll introduce in a moment. Um, my name is Dr Melody Redman. I'm a clinical genetics registrar in Leeds. But before we start, I just want to cover a couple of bits of housekeeping. Um, so firstly, just to say all of your microphones will be muted and your video cameras off throughout the talk. We do really want to hear your questions, so please throughout the talk pop your questions in the Q&A and we'll come to those at the end um, where we'll get the opportunity to um, discuss some of the questions that have come up. But also at the end of the talk, we'll be sharing a QR code which will be linked to the evaluation of today's event. And we really value your feedback and we use this to improve future talks. So please do provide feedback at the end. Also, when you're providing your um, evaluation, there'll be an opportunity to tell us if you'd like a CPD certificate. Um, so that the point to do that is at the point of submitting your evaluation. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr Louise Hartley, who is a consultant paediatric neurologist at the Royal London Hospital. So Dr Hartley previously worked at the University Hospital of Wales, where she set up the paediatric neuromuscular service for Wales and initiated the treatment of SMA patients with nucinersin therapy. And over the last year, she's been with the Neuromuscular Service at the Evelina Children's Hospital in London, providing Solgensma gene therapy for children with SMA. So I'll now hand over to you, Dr Hartley. Um, we're really grateful to have you here presenting on this topic. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Yep. So I'm Louise Hartley. I currently work um, at the Royal London Hospital. I've been here for five years and um, uh, before that, I was in Wales um, for some for 13 years where I really did a lot of neuromuscular work. In my current role, I just see a lot of general neurology, which includes a lot of neuromuscular work, including SMA, but it's very, very broad, my current role. But I do do some clinics at the um, Evelina, which is the, as you probably know, is one of the um, Zolgensma treatment sites. There are three in, in, um, in England and one of them is um, at the Evelina, so I'm a, a little bit involved with um, with delivering the Zolgensma service. Although my current job is is um, is very broad and not just neuromuscular. Um, but so uh, next slide. So yeah, yeah. I've, in the past, I've undertaken some consultancy for Roche, and then then next slide. Then is the start of the talk. Okay, so this is the condition we're talking about. Um, it's an autosome recessive condition and we're talking about what we call 5Q spinal muscular atrophy. So, so the gene lies on, on the long arm of chromosome 5. There are non-5Q non SMAs which are super, super rare um, and there are a little, a little bunch of other diseases that can affect the anterior horn cell. But this talk is about the 5Q autosome recessive SMA, which is actually common relatively, you know, as, as recessive diseases go. And actually, for me, working in, the, in, a, in a very general setting at the moment, not a dedicated neuromuscular unit, actually, I see quite a lot because it's, a, you know, it's a common condition relatively. Um, so uh, about one in six to 10,000 births, it's, it's due to mutations in a single gene, SMN1. And over 95% of cases, uh, the children have homozygous deletion of exon 7, sometimes exon 8 as well, but always exon 7 in the SMN1 gene, uh, let the other the other 5% or less uh, will usually have an exon 7 deleted in one allele and a point mutation in the other allele. But it is very unusual for us not to just uh, easily find exon 7 biallelically bi deleted. So the mutation carrier frequency of, of about 1 in 40 um, might be a bit lower in some populations, but in most populations seem to be about 1 in 40. So it, it, it's pretty common. It's, you know, after cystic fibrosis, it's the next most common, um, commonly carried um, uh, gene mutation. Um, and the result of this homozygous deletion of exon 7 in the SMM1 gene is that there are reduced levels of the protein that this gene codes for, and that's SMN or survival motor neuron protein. And that's both in the central nervous system, but also in peripheral tissues, as, as we'll, we'll have a little look at. But primarily, the, the, the reason the disease manifests is because the lack of this protein in the central nervous system, well, actually in the nervous system, results in de de degeneration of anterior horn cells, 
loss of the low metaneurone um, that you know that comes from the anterior horn cell and then subsequent atrophy of the muscles that 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 low metaneurone is 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 uh, innovating which is why 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 the, then the name comes from it's a, it's a it's an, an atrophy of muscles with a you know spinal origin which is um actually the anterior horn cell of the low metaneurone um so that's what we see that the clinically what we're seeing is this last uh, the the sequel sequelae of that loss of anterior horn cells and the subsequent uh, muscle weakness and atrophy but it, it is actually ubiquitously expressed. It's expressed in the central nervous system as well as uh, as, as all tissues, actually, all peripheral tissues. So th that does have some implications now, particularly now we're treating it. Um, that you know that it's not just a, a, a not just a, a, a protein expressed in the anterior horn cell. Okay, next slide. So. Um, as I said, it's, it's a homozygous deletion, usually in, almost invariably of, of uh, exon sevens by allelically in the SMN1 gene. And the result of this is a spectrum of weakness. So um, any of you that are familiar with um, spinal muscular atrophy will be aware that it's um, it, it's given a number according to the maximum motor milestone achieved. So um, we have most commonly um, type one and that by definition this is children who who never sit and of course the, these definitions were were, uh, uh, were derived before we had the gene and, and you know, understood um, you know how the condition uh, 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 arose and, and and how the spectrum of, of weakness arose so type one was the clinical description of a child who with you know severe spinal muscular atrophy who ne never achieved sitting as a milestone and then type twos sit but never walk independently and the type threes walk independently and then there are super rare type zeros where there's a, a prenatal onset so the baby is already severely affected at birth they usually have very severe joint contractures and are ventilator dependent from work from birth and then there's a, a, a again a, a quite rare type four which is, has an adult onset so the majority of these children present in childhood um, and they're type one two and three um, so and the life expectancy you know the, as you'd get the impression from the fact that you know the type ones are inevitably much more severe they don't even have the ability to sit and their life expectancy untreated is is uh usually less than two years um the type twos uh, historically life expectancy is between 20 and 40 years and the type threes will have a normal life expectancy so next slide so to understand why we have this spectrum of um, of disease uh, severity, and also to understand how uh, two of the three treatments that we have work, it's really important to understand uh, a little bit more about the genetics. So, um, the area of chromosome five Q where the SMM one gene sits, that, that the bunch of genes that uh, of that include SMN1 and some adjacent genes uh, over the course of evolution, that, that area of the of the of Pi Q has duplicated and inverted. So it's flipped over and you get these um these uh, phenocopy genes. So you get uh, the SMN1 is on is, is the telomeric um end and um you get this uh, a little group of genes which are um, uh, almost identical that are, have been duplicated and flipped over on the Central America end. And I, I mean, probably there's some evolutionary, well, even advantage in general for duplication of genes. And 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 definitely in the case of SMA, um, there's a, a definite survival advantage to the fact that this duplication has happened. So SMN2 then becomes a really important gene to understand, and it differs from SMN1 in by in by eight nucleotides across the whole gene and crucially in exon seven which is the exon we're particularly interested in with um in sma because that's the one that's usually um you know homozygously deleted in exon seven smn2 has one just one uh, nucleotide that's different so there's a c to t base base change um six base pairs inside exon seven so it's, it's very 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 similar <laughs> and, and the next slide um, SMN2, but the result of of that nucleotide uh, change is that exon seven is usually spliced out. So usually SMN2 is behaving like an exon seven deleted SMN1, i.e., it's pretty it's useless. It, exon seven is spliced out and no functional protein is made. But for some reason, about ten percent of the time, when SMN2 is transcribed, um, 
Exxon 7 is, isn't spliced out. So, uh, so SMN2, a, a copy of SMN2 will make about 10% of, of, of the 100% of, the of SMN protein that um, you'd hope from SMN1. So um, this, this is uh, kind of crucial to understand. So let, next slide. I, actually, I think, uh, yeah, yeah, so this is where I saw, I'd, got, I'd put in another slide that I'm not going to show. So basically, um, you've now got SMN2 is producing uh, a small quantity of functional protein and we have uh, a varying copy number uh, that, uh, that, that explains the spectrum of disease. So you have to have some, if you've, if you've, if your home is actually diluted, deleted for exon 7 of SMN1 and you don't have any SMN2, you're not going to survive fetal life. You're not going to, you know, you're the, fetus, the embryo is not going to survive very long at all. You need some SMN protein to produce to survive fetal life, to get through fetal life. Um, and so the fact that um, does the fact we have any postnatal experience of SMA is because of SMN2 and most children with SMN with type 1 SMA will have two copies of SMN2 as shown by these pie, pie diagrams. Most children with type 2 SMA will have three copies so they're going to so the, the, the one to two copies are going to be making about 20% of the SMN protein. Type 2 they've got in, most of them have got three copies so they're making about 30% and the type 3s um, three or four copies so and, and so on so uh, you have to have some, else you won't, you won't, you won't have a, you, be, you won't survive to be to, to 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 delivery. So if you're born with SMA, you must have at least one, usually two or three or four copies of SMN2, and that's the reason you survive, and that explains that the the the, the, the spectrum in in um in uh in severity. So the next slide, um, just this is just to sort of fill in a little bit more now on that table we looked at earlier. So. Most of the children with type zero, which is very rare, will have one copy. They'll have to have one copy. If they had zero copies, they wouldn't wouldn't have got to postnatal life. Um, about three quarters of children with type one SMA have two copies, but um, a, a significant proportion, about 20%, have only one copy of SMN2. You see, sorry, if you look on the far right uh, column, and about 7% will have three copies. So it, it's not, you can't pr completely predict the phenotype based on the on the SMN2 copy number, there is a, 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 a variation, you know, some variability. Most patients with type 2 uh, will uh, have, so 78% will have three copies, but some have two or four copies. And then uh, the type 3 and 4, you know, you've got increasing copy numbers, even up to six or even more copies. Uh, next slide. OK, so just and then just breaking down a little bit more into. Um, uh, the spectrum again, we, we, as, as we've you know become, become increasingly familiar with the disease and the treatments, we we recognise subcategories within this this spectrum. So, if we look at type one, we now divide type one into A, B, and C. So one A are children that present within the first fifty days of life. So that usually often on day one they'll have you know they'll have some head lag, they'll be a bit weak and floppy, and that, you know they evidently got um, a disease by uh, fifteen days of age. The type one B, which is the most common. Uh, type of one present before three months and the type 1c who are a little bit milder present after three months and altogether type 1 makes up um, about 50 percent of all of SMA um, and then just looking at the type 3s you can see there's a 3a and a 3b so the 3as are the children that present before three years and the 3bs after the ones that present before three years they walk because by definition to have type 3 they must walk but um uh, the ones that present before three years have a very significant risk of, uh, of, of, of stopping walking with time because this is a degenerative condition. OK, so the next slide. So this is just um, the, the classical uh, phenotype of type 1 SMA, which, as I said, is about 50 percent of the total. So these are floppy infants and they have proximal weakness. Um, they have these bright alert faces, so there's no my myopathic faces. Um, they have normal eye movements, so they look around, they're very alert and interested. Um, the things that distinguish them from other floppy weak babies that, um, is that they have diaphragmatic breathing. So um, you can get a slight sense of that from this, just these still photos that the, the belly is quite so expanded because the diaphragm is descending and that in within inspiration, which is a normal breathing pattern. But the chest is not the chest excursion is very poor. So the intercostal muscles are very weak and all the breathing is happening with the tummy, with the diaphragm. So you get this, uh, the chest starts to narrow and um, 
and they get what's called a bell-shaped chest actually and this baby's got a little bit of pectus excavatum so they, they have this is a you know this we only really see this with with um, sma if you see a baby with diaphragmatic breathing with poor chest excursion that's you know that that's your game on that this is going to be sma about a third of the children have tongue fasciculations, and that, that's a feature of, of, of denovation and re-innovation. It's quite a hard sign, actually, but um, about a third will have that. All the babies are very reflexing. They never have deep tendon reflexes. And then you have this quite interesting pattern of weakness where the, the legs are weaker than the arms. And you can get a sense of that with this baby that, that, that well, obviously it's a still, but you can see that that baby's move it has lifted the arms from the elbow. Um, um, and the distal muscles are weaker than the proximal muscles. So the they tend to sometimes have a little bit of movement at the hips, but uh, sorry, at the um, uh, at the feet, but not at the hips. They might wiggle their feet a bit, but not move their hips. And likewise, they, they won't really move their shoulders, but you can see this baby's able to lift their arms at the elbow and they might you know, have some reasonable uh, hand movement. And this is this is a curious pattern and it's to do with the pattern in which the um, anterior horn cells die. So they um, they die. Um, generate corderostrally and medially anteriorly and it just happens in, in the spinal cord it just happens that that they, those are the that's the uh, you know they, they take out the big proximal muscles first and the le you know the, the lower muscles uh, you know the, as in the legs earlier than the shoulder muscles so that's a very it's a very very pathognomonic pattern we don't really see it in any other disease and it's you know once you've seen a case of type 1 SMA it's very very easy to pick there's not really a differential it's it's a very easy diagnosis to make okay next slide so um as i mentioned the tongue fasciculation is um is is a feature of, of denervation and and uh, the 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 dying nerve cells trying to sprout um, and re-innovate and that's manifested in the type 2 and 3 sma as tremor so you'll very commonly see a hand tremor in type 2 and 3 sma which again is a very helpful distinguishing feature because that's an unusual uh, uh, you know feature to see in a, it normally in a child with a uh, in a neuromuscular condition so the type two children, um, as we said, they'll sit unsupported and, and often they'll have normal milestones up to sitting, but then they'll, they might crawl or they might not, you know, they might, they might just sit and that's what, that's the only milestone they achieve, or they might crawl, they might even pull to stand, they might even walk pushing a walker, but they'll never walk independently. So it's quite, again, these are all spectrums. It's not, they're not, an, um, they're, they're, there's a, uh, you know, anything can happen between just sitting unsupported and almost walking independently and there will be a type two. And the type three children, as I said, walk independently, but they'll have signs particularly of hip girdle weakness. So they'll have probably a waddle and, and a Gower's manoeuvre would be classical. Um, but the tremor, you know, th th there's obviously quite a big differential for the type twos and threes. They're a bit harder to spot because there's quite a lot of other conditions that can present in this way, such as Duchenne for a type three or, or a, you know, a myriad of uh, 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 different neuromuscular conditions for type two, but if they've got a tremor, that's a, a and 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 you can't get reflexes. That's kind of a a, a good sign, a, a good a, a helpful signs that this is likely to be SMA. So next slide. So this is just a kind of a, a summary slide of what I've just said. So we've got a tiny tiny percentage of type zero, then fifty percent of type uh, type one, and uh, the majority of those have two copies of SMN two. Uh, um, about 30% are type 2 and most of those have three copies. Then it's about 10% of, uh, of children will be type 3A and they have they have a significant risk. 60% will lose ambulation uh, over the uh, course of, uh, of, of their lifetime. And then about 9% are, are the three Bs who will continue walking but will have a waddle and a gowers. OK, so that's just a little summary. OK, so the next slide then. So uh, just looking at type one, the most common cause of SMA, we know that by the age of six months, uh, uh, about 95% of the lower motor neurons have been lost just because of this anterior horn cell degeneration. And we know that uh, untreated, the median aid of intervention is that the children need nutritional support by eight months. So although they um, don't always have bulbar failure early on, they will develop bulbar involvement. Um, by 11 months, the mean, the mean the children will be requiring ventilatory support um, and uh, the median age of death untreated is 20 months. Um, OK, so then the next slide. So uh, the genes, Verdening and Hoffman, which is the, used to be the name for type 1 SMA, first described it in 1891 and we found the gene, the gene was first identified in 1995. Partly because of um, the understanding of SMN2, uh, 
two treatments, nusinersin and risdiplam, which um, are effective by um, by by their uh, their effect on SMN2, uh, were trialled in the, the the beginning of the 2010s and as Zolgensman, which is the uh, gene therapy, um, well, well, they were all at pretty much at the same time actually, but um, um, the gene therapy, which is replacing the whole gene, not just not just uh, trying to splice uh, splice X or uh, the uh, SMN2. Uh, these three uh, treatments have become available, really, you know, over the last decade, um, and are now you know available uh, in many countries, including the UK. Um, that have been approved by. Uh, by NICE and we are able to use all three of these treatments. So I'll, I'll spend some time now going into the details of these. Next slide. So I don't know that how, how much you, you're aware of these treatments, but nusinersin, which was the first um, drug to be uh, licensed to, for the, you know, to have positive trials and, um, and be licensed, is delivered by intrathecal injection. So it's delivered by lumbar puncture. And it increases SMN2, basically. Um, uh, we'll look a little bit at how it does that. Risdiplam um, is also increasing uh, SMN2 uh, in its orals. So it's a daily oral dose, whereas nusinersin is an intermittent. It's every four months uh, lumbar puncture. But these are treatments you have to have lifelong. They're not, um, you know, you, you, you'll stop making SMN2 if you stop taking them. And then um, honest menagene, which is Zolgensma, is... Um, a replacement of the SMN1 gene via a viral vector, and that's a, a currently a single, well, it's a single intravenous injection. So uh, next slide. Um, so I'll look at, we'll look a bit at how they work in a minute, but um, these were the uh, uh, pivotal trials in SMA1, and this is where mo most of the trial work has been in SMA1, um, and we can have a look at these in, in some of the subsequent slides, but we had, we had, um, we had, uh, trials um, of uh, pre-symptomatic children who were um, pretty much all younger siblings of children, you know, families who'd had a, a, already had a, a child with SMA and then went on to have another child and knew that they were, you know, at high risk and, um, and had that child tested at birth. So we had um, each, each of the drugs was trialled in pre-symptomatic children. We had the pivotal trials in the um, in the infants with SMA1 and then there were, uh, there, there were uh, these early trials of older children um, with nusinus and risdiplam, so children with, you know, with established SMA. Um, okay, so the next slide. So these are the, um, just, these are the, you'll come across these um, motor assessments because these are the standardised functional motor assessments that have been used and for the, uh, for the children, for the, for the babies under the age of two, uh, the CHOP in 10, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia Infant Testing Neuromuscular Disorder is the uh, is the scale that's used. And uh, for the uh, older children who can uh, uh, sit and uh, or and do more, there's the Hammersmith Functional Motor Scale and the Motor Function Measure Score. So just that they're, they're in some of the slides where I talk some, about some of the trial outcomes, I'll mention those um, those functional motor assessments. Next slide. OK, so this is new Nursin. Um, so um, this is an antisense oligonucleotide, as is risdiplam. So it's basically a small string of nucleotides that target SMN2 pre-messenger RNA and prevent exon 7 from being spliced out. Um, so it acts as a splicing modifier. It targets the intronic splicing silencer N1. And this allows SMN2 to prevent a full length protein. It stops it splicing it, 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 rather than just that 10 percent of SMN being made, um, it, it's, it, it allows maybe not 100 percent, but a, a lot more, but well, hopefully 100 percent of SMN to be made. So, so you get um, SMN protein produced from SMN2. You're doing nothing with SMN1, you're just working on SMN2. So um, next slide. So this was the, the uh, hugely exciting um, moment in 2016 when um, the the pivotal trial of um, of, of Nusinersin, um published its interim re result. They did an interim analysis. It's a, tr it's a, a trial called Endear, and it was a double blind sham procedure. So they gave two thirds of the um, children uh, intrathecal uh, nusinersin, and then they had a, a, a sham blinded group who they just made a little pinprick. 
in the back so that the the, the, the treating doctors and parents wouldn't know that they hadn't had, they didn't actually lumber puncture them but they they made a little um print, print on the back and put a plaster on so it looked, they wouldn't know whether or not they'd had a lumbar puncture and this the interim analysis was uh so uh the results were so effective so good that um what we'll move to the next slide so there were 122 infants uh, from 31 centres worldwide in an, in an RCT. Two thirds received nursing and a third the sham procedure. Uh, these were all babies. They were seven months at screening. Some were up to eight months, I think, by the time they were treated. And they all had two SMN2 copy numbers, so we were predicted to have type one SMA. And at the end of the, at the end of the study, so at the interim results, uh, um, yeah, well, at the end of the study. Um, so there was a significant improved in motor milestones. So 51% had improved, um, and the one the sham group none had improved. This is not this is a, a disease that, that is relentlessly degenerative. The children don't achieve any milestones; they just lose them. So the the sham uh, control group none had regained any milestones uh, in the group receiving use of nursing. 22% had head control, 10% could roll, 8% could sit, 1% could stand. So this this compared to the natural history of 0% of the children not receiving medication, making any motor progress. This was absolutely uh, astonishing. And um, like the risk of death of uh, permanent ventilator usage was 50% lower in the treatment group. Um, and there was a, an, an improvement in the chopping 10 scale in three quarters of the infant. Um, and the other thing that was uh, striking was that uh, the likelihood of survival and not requiring a ventilator was higher in the treatment infants treated earlier, so in less than 13 weeks, which you know is is important. So uh, next slide. As a result of that trial, the the, the trial was you know was was um uh, was stopped at the inter well wasn't stopped it but everyone got moved onto the uh, onto the treatment uh, uh, arm uh, after the interim analysis and. In 2016, the, the company made uh, Neustonesson available on an expanded access program uh, to all type one babies while we um, while we waited for uh, you know countries to fund it. And so it's delivered by intrathecal injection. Um, there's a loading dose of four doses over two months. You have quite an intensive every couple of two or three weeks over uh, two months, you have four doses. And then following that, you need four monthly maintenance dosing forever. Um, it's very expensive. <laughs> And we have um, the NICE agreed to fund it under a managed access agreement um, with strict eligibility and stop criteria and with uh, the um, the collation of. Um, of um, sorry, my phone's going off the collation of um, of uh, a, a clinical data as we, as we went with 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 the uh, treatments. Um, so next slide. So the eligibility criteria are um, currently uh, for Newson nursing are that um, you, the, the children have to have genetically confirmed 5Q SMA, can be type 1, 2 or 3 or pre-symptomatic, but if they're pre-symptomatic they have to be predicted to develop type 1 or 2, which normally means 2 or 3 SMN2 copy numbers. They have to have no not be permanently ventilated or have a tracheostomy. Um, IT injection has to be feasible, uh, and that's not always the case because some of them have had spinal fusion, or uh, particularly the older children um, have had severe scoliosis from their you know, weak spinal muscles. So not all children, uh, it's not feasible in all children. And the, if they're type three, then as long as they've had symptom onset before the age of 19 years, and they can comply with monitoring and data collection and don't have another life limiting condition. So it's actually very broad, the, um, the eligibility criteria it encompasses pretty much everybody. Next line. And then the stop criteria is if there's worsening in the motor score on two consecutive visits or ventilation becomes permanent or inability to deliver, they're the stop criteria. So next slide. So we've now, as of last summer, we had um, about 13,000 people treated worldwide. So about nine years follow up. It's very well tolerated. Some of the children need a general aesthetic because they don't like having a lumbar puncture and occasionally interventional radiology is needed to get, to get into the fecal sac. It is evident as we, you know, as we gained, um, we collected data and gained more post-trial experience that 
as that uh, NDA showed, if you start the disease, you start the treatment later in the disease course, it's less effective. And that would make sense because these these anti horn cells are dying and you need to rescue them before too many have died rather than late in the court disease course. Um, it also seems to be less effective for the bulbar respiratory symptoms. And um, there's also an emerging phenotype of treated children with speech language delay, uh, which doesn't just seem to be a bulbar problem. Um, and we wonder if actually SMN proteins, as I said before, is ubiquitously expressed, including in, in the central nervous system. We wonder um, how much the SMN protein is needed for fetal brain development. So now with this group of type one children who previously wouldn't have survived, we're seeing that um, the children are surviving and, and that some of them have a, what seems to be a central speech language delay. Next slide. Oh, sorry, next slide. Um, yes, this was just that uh, this is. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, no, that's sorry. Because I've added in a slide. So, uh, OK, Rizdaplan, um is another antisense oligonucleotide. So this is uh, orally administered and it's a daily dose. Again, it's a splicing modifier, um, binds to two sites on SMN2 pre mRNA and um, it promotes the inclusion of exon 7 and uh, full length a transcript of the SMN protein. It crosses the blood-brain barrier, so that's why it doesn't have to be delivered intrathecally. And uh, one advantage of the fact that it's um, given orally is that there's a systemic delivery to all tissues. And at, at the moment, it's not clear how what that will in, in mean. But you know, we, as, I, as I said before, we do know that SMN protein is expressed in all tissues, so it's probably going to be advantageous to promote its uh, its uh, expression in more than just the um, the anterior horn cells. Um, again, it's licensed for uh, in, in the in, in the UK and uh, Europe, it's licensed for type one, two and three SMA over the age of two months old, providing they have between one and four SMN2 copies. In the States, it's uh, it's also approved now for under two months of age. But at the moment, we can't use it in the in the in the newborn babies. We have to wait till they're two months old. Um, next slide. So just uh, this was the. Um, the NDEA equivalent um, of, for Rizdaplam, of firefish. So this was type 1B patients, so the ones that present before the age of three months, and they were dosed by seven months. And at three years, 96% were alive without permanent ventilation, whereas, you know, the natural history would be that, you know, 99% of these children, well, 100% actually would be dead without any ventilation at this stage. So, um, and all would need some ventilation. So that, you know, this was an astonishing result. 60% were sitting unsupported um, and that increased over the three years of treatment and the numbers sitting, they didn't all start to sit immediately, but they began to sit gradually and oral feeding was preserved in the vast majority. So again, you know, really astonishing good results. Next line. And then the uh, the later on, so SMA two and three, sunfish and jewelfish were the pivotal studies. The patients reported and, and continue to report stability in their um, in their disease, so not deteriorating as, as you'd expect. They don't get worse. They stay stable on treatment and often small but meaningful for the patients increases in strength and stamina. So it might be that they can perhaps lift a full cup where previously they couldn't. They could only lift half a cup or you know, they, they, there are things that they can maybe open a can, things that uh, are hard to capture in a in a in a functional scale, but are meaningful to the the uh, the, the children and families. So the sunfish um, showed uh, an increase in uh, the MFM thirty two, the uh, motor function measure, um, by one to two points. So this is not these are not huge increases, but they are you know the stability plus or minus some improvement. Um, and jewelfish um, was a, was a very broad group of patients between the ages of two to sixty, who'd previously had other treatments, and they saw a stabilisation uh, in their motor function score. So, um, Roth were pretty pleased with that. Next slide. So the safety, uh, they seem to be very well tolerated, actually. There were some early reports with nusinersen of hydrocephalus, but they've been very, very few. I think they mean maybe between three and five, you know, from 13,000 people treated. So we're not entirely sure what that is about, but it's not been a, a, you know, a consistent or very troublesome problem. Uh, some of the children get some mild thrombocytopenia and proteinuria, but nothing clinically significant. 
Some get lumbar puncture related side effects. Obviously, you can get headaches following the lumbar puncture. And of course, there's the problem of uh, needing uh, you know, repeated general anesthesia for um, for some of the younger children who, who don't like having a lumbar puncture, which is obviously not great. Uh, Risdeplam, um, a lot of the children get a, a bit of diarrhea and some skin rashes, which are usually not, uh, not don't require the drug to be stopped. They usually uh, resolve and are not too troublesome. Risdeplam, there were some um, in the preclinical animal studies, there was some retinal thinking, uh, sickening, sorry, in some non-human primates and um, some photoreceptor degeneration and in fact, this is partly why um, Nucinus and got ahead of the curve actually, because they were being developed in parallel really, but Risdeplam, when it was in development, got set back uh, by a year or so while this was, they, they put the, the studies on hold while they uh, investigated this. Um, and and as, as a result, you know, Risdeplam then ended up not finishing its trials and uh, and becoming licensed for, uh, you know, a, a couple of years after Nucinus. And although it seems to be equipotent and, uh, you know, we've got a lot of children on intrathecal nucinusin who probably would otherwise have been on risdeplam. Some are swapping over, but um, I think you know risdeplam was a bit behind the curve because of this um, retinal thickening. That, but it hasn't. It, it's been very carefully studied in the children treated, and none of them have had any problems. Uh, it's also got a potential effect on male fertility and potential um, embryo fetal toxicity. So, um, so adults taking uh, risdeplam are advised not to get pregnant while they're on it. OK, next slide. So then Zolgensma on is uh, a viral vector gene therapy. So this is a, 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 you know, a copy of the SMN1 gene um, packaged into an AAV9 uh, virus, which is a, a pretty benign virus um, which affects all cells, including crossing the blood-brain barrier and getting into the uh, spinal cord in the brain. The uh, the DNA doesn't, the SMN gene doesn't integrate into the genome of the patient. It, it gets into the nucleus and it is then transcribed and makes SMN protein, but doesn't get doesn't get incorporated to the patient's genome. Um, next slide. So this is uh, uh, licensed for genetically confirmed type one, the cl clinical diagnosis of type one SMA. So this is in the in the UK. This is children under six months of age with a diagnosis of clinical diagnosis of type one or if they're seven to 12 months of age um, and a national team, which sits, sits very frequently um, uh, of experts, considers that they're um, about 70% likely to achieve sitting, they're allowed to have it, but mostly it's the younger children, it's usually the under six months that have it. And there's also now weight cut off and they also need not to be um, traked or ventilated for more than 16 hours, that, that, that's an exclusion criteria. And, uh, and also pre-symptomatic children uh, with with you know, with, with up to three copies with known known you know um, biallelic exon seven deletions in SM one and up to three copies of SM two. So those are the the group of children that are in, uh, eligible for uh, Zorgensma. Next line, and we have about seven years now of uh, both clinical trial and subsequently real world data. The clinical trial, uh, the children were this so that was um, uh, Sprint, I think it was. I th it showed in the earlier slide. Um, those, the children were under six months at dosing. Um, actually, in the real world data, older children have been treated up to the age of five. Um, again, the greatest benefit is seems to be when it's administered um, prior to symptom onset. As, as you know, we mentioned at the beginning, in the type these type one children that are receiving Zolgensma, 95% of their motor neurons have been lost by six months. So we need to try and get in before they're losing that that number of neurons. Um, the children. Although this is a benign virus and doesn't is not known to cause disease in um, in in regular life, it uh, we we get the, the number of particles given are absolutely astronomical, and they there are some um, sequelae to that. So um, the children need uh, steroids. In fact, you show the next slide. I think we've got the yeah. So the the children. Uh, very frequently have um, some fever and vomiting as they as they get this huge infusion of virus um, for the first few days and about a third of patients get hepatotoxicity which is then monitored for 12 weeks so they have weekly bloods for about 12 weeks um, most a lot will get a transaminitis but this usually resolves uh, by a couple of weeks um, however there have been two fatalities from hepatic toxicity so that in russia and kazakhstan a 28 month old and a four month old baby developed liver acute liver failure 
six or seven weeks uh, post the gene therapy. So, um, yeah, so I did that, so I'll move on that up on the next slide, I think. So, so a lot of the many of them get some thrombocytopenia, but that resolves spontaneously. Um, there's sometimes asymptomatic transient rising cardiac enzymes, and there have been four cases of thrombotic microangiopathy. So it's not a completely benign treatment. Um, so it does have to be monitored quite carefully. Um, next slide. And because of the hepatotoxicity in particular, um, all the children are pre-treated with prednisolone. And of course, that then uh, has you know, potential side effects. It, it risks the children getting adrenal suppression if they end up on, on um, several weeks or even months of prednisolone while we wait for their liver enzymes to settle. This is a young, young population who are likely to be chickenpox and measles naive. And so we, it, that we can't give their live vaccines while they're on so that's the, the immunization schedule is delayed and it does it's the hepatotoxicity is currently being investigated by the MHRA it does seem to be uh, more of a risk in the ch old, heavier children and in UK now at the moment as, as of a few weeks ago uh, previously there, there were some children who were um, older than 12 months were being treated or heavier but now the limit at the moment is under 12 months and um, less than 13.5 kilos so the older children or the heavier children are not being treated and the theory being that you know if we're giving that you give uh, the doses dependent on your body weight, so obviously giving much bigger doses to the heavier children. Next slide. So one thing that children have to not have AAV9 antibodies, um, and so they they have to be tested before they're treated. And obviously, if they have got antibodies, um, they either either that they've you know from their mum, uh, um, transplacental. Um, uh, transfer or that they've uh, seen AAV9 in the, in the few months they've been alive, they can't have it. Um, with, if it's transplacental, then you, we can wait for the AAV9 antibodies to go away and, and give the gene therapy later. And of course, the other flip side of that is that once they've had AAV9 therapy, they can't ever have it again because they'll have antibodies and they'll reject it. So this is a once off treatment. Um, if they've got intercurrent viral illness or pre existing liver disease, then again, it's, it's put on hold until that's sorted. So there are it's not it's not not everyone can have it. Next slide. So all three of these drugs, they improve motor function and motor milestone acquisition. They all improve event free survival. They all help maintain oral feeding and the ability to come off ventilation. Um, next slide. The most dramatic uh, results have been in the pre-symptomatic trials. So SPRINT was the pre-symptomatic uh, trial for Zolgensma. Uh, they gave 14 babies who were, you know, siblings of other previously diagnosed children, all of whom had two copies of SMN2 and were diagnosed at birth. They gave, uh, they were all treated before the age of six weeks. Uh, none of them at 14 months needed pump ventures. I don't think any of them even now have, and we're now several years down the line, actually. Um, none of them required feeding support. Um, 11 out of 14 were standing, um, uh, you know, and, and many walked. I mean, most of these babies look uh, uh, completely normal. Most of these babies have got no symptoms from their SMA. So treating these babies before the age of six weeks with, with, a, with a gene therapy has been absolutely dramatic. Um, and then next slide. And then Nurture, which was the pre-symptomatic trial of Nusinersin, uh, 15 children with two copies of SMN2 and 10 with three copies of SMN2, again, all treated before six weeks of age. Um, all of them were sitting, um, 22 out of 25 were walking uh, independently. You no, know, ab absolutely dramatic uh, results for children that without treatment would have, would have achieved absolutely no motor milestones and in fact would have been deteriorating and, lo and losing skills such as, uh, as self-ventilating. And then, Rain next slide, sorry. Rainbow Fish was the Rizdaplam pre symptomatic trial, and they had six children uh, with two or three copies of SMN2, and again, 100% were um, sitting, 67% were standing, 50% were independently walking. So uh, after 12 months, uh, you know, really, uh, uh, all all of these drugs are, are amazing if they're given pre symptomatically. Okay, so next slide. So we have three licensed drugs currently. Um, Obviously, the approval is very broad, or particularly for um, for the antisense oligonucleotides, ristoplam and eucinosin. It's much broader than the population that were in the clinical trials. Of course, the trials inevitably had a relatively short observation period, and we've now got you know up to nine years of of um, of, of uh, 
observation in, in, in the real world. And there are no head to head comparisons. We, we haven't had any any trials that uh, head to head compa compare these three drugs. Um, so I'll look a little bit more at, at, um, at the treatment landscape, which is you know, which is dynamic. There are other other treatments um, uh, being developed and um, there's also the really important possibility of newborn screening. There are also trials looking at treatment switches and combination therapies, and I've got a few more slides on that we can have a look at. Um, we are aware of the need to collect additional real world evidence, so um, many countries have registries with mandated uh, collection of data on treated patients, um, which should allow us to begin to detect differences in the in the in the efficacy of these these three drugs in the real world over the you know five to nine years we've been uh, using them or, or increasingly as we use them. So certainly in the UK, any child um, receiving any of these treatments has to be part of a managed access agreement and they have to attend you know, the, the six monthly or whatever the you know mandated um, uh, follow up is and you know have a very thorough assessment and uh, you know that the, the, the condition of continuing treatment that they uh, remain uh, under you know um, in a registry with mandated collection of data so we can see actually what what is going to happen long term. Next slide. So this is an example of, of um, a, a recent it was February uh, in Brain uh, uh, just just last month of a, um, a, this, a, this is a group from um, it's uh, German Austria and I, th I can't remember I think it was another country so some of the northern European countries where they have mandated um, collection of data on all their type 1 babies uh, treated uh, with nucinesin for up to 38 months. So this is obviously, you know, this is the real world data as opposed to the, the limited trial data. And um, in the children who were started under the age of two years, there were uh, major improvements in motor function with a third achieving independent sitting. However, not such good improvement in the bulb and respiratory function as there was in the, in the motor skills. The motor improvement seemed to be greatest in the first 14 months um, and then uh, plateaued with stabilisation. They're not deteriorating, but stabilising. Um, and this is compared obviously to the pre-symptomatic children who uh, many of whom in the trial have, have, have age appropriate motor and increasingly, uh, sorry, in, the, in, this, in this study as well, the children in this study that were treated pre-symptomatically um, have had age appropriate motor development. The children that were treated after two years didn't achieve any new motor milestones. Some of them did get a, a small increase in their chop in 10 score, but none of them sat or stood or walked where they weren't you know, already doing that. And um, the concern about the fact that bulbar respiratory function is um, is not improving as much as the as the generalized motor function has led um, uh, people to worry, wonder if if actually there's a, a sort of a, a gravitational effect of, of nucinus and that it's you know it's delivered into the lumbar thecal sac and um, it's maybe even though obviously the children <laughs> lying down when they have the lumbar puncture, it, it's um there's a concern that maybe the, 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 just the they're not getting enough nucinus and into the into the you know higher up um, anti horn cells and in the bulb or the yeah, thoracic and bulbar regions. Um, so there's a current trial called Devote which is um, a trial of higher dose into the equinusinus and to see if, if they can get uh, better bioavailability of the drug into the bulbar and cervical motor nuclei. So that, that's some um, current. Next slide. It is evident that bulbar function in SMA um, does remain a problem. Um, a lot of these children, despite treatment, have uh, impairments in swallowing. They have restricted a range of, of, of movement and strength of the mandible. They get jaw contractures. Um, many of them will get have a weak suck, um, recurrent lower respiratory tract infections, and of course, you know that they're losing. Uh, well, they they're at risk before treatment of losing um, uh, anterior horn cells in the in the cranial nerves. Um, and speech is also affected. So a lot of these treated children now have uh, quite a lot of speech difficulties and some of that is bulbar. So articulation, not sufficient respiratory support for speech, uh, often not great resonance with hypernasality, poor venation, pitch volume control, but also, as I mentioned earlier, there does seem to be some children who have more of a, a cognitive central uh, speech problem, not just a bulbar uh, you know, articulation or you know, lower motor neuron problem. Um, so it does seem that, um, oh, sorry, sorry, next slide, sorry. 
uh, that the most benefit um, is uh, seen by the younger children with severe forms of SMA, particularly if they're treated early in the disease course or ideally presymptomatically. Older children and adults may accrue some benefit also, in particular, they may exp experience stability. And actually, for patients, stability is really important in the context of neurodegenerative disease. Not losing skills, even if they don't gain any, not losing any is huge for them. Um, it, but how it, it, it is, it, it, I mean, these are extremely expensive drugs and um, it's it's really important that the standards of care and this sort of multidisciplinary approach are, um, are, are maintained um, and that there's active intervention with therapies, uh, that nutritional um, status is, is maximised, um, you know, that, that, that it, it, it's obviously um, be a disaster to spend all this money on the drugs and then not provide the, the 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 therapeutic and nutritional and so on support that the children need to to keep themselves in good shape. Next slide. So um, so I mentioned earlier that you know S SMN is not just expressed in um, anti horn cells; it's required for the viability of all cells and. Um, Restoring the full length um, SMN protein seems safe and effective, but in a lot of children it's not a cure. And um, we're increasingly uh, you know, understanding what the biological functions of SMN are. So it has canonical roles in RNA processing and splicing and non-canonical roles in ribosome, mitochondrial and proteasome function. Um, it might be that it has tissue specific functions that vary across the lifespan. Um, and different organs might be affected at different times, both pre and postnatally, including the, the, the brain uh, prenatally. And, and in a way, particularly because SMA1 is the most severe of these and is the most common of these. And we don't, you know, prior to treatments, we didn't have longitudinal, you know, the children didn't survive for us to have any idea as to what this disease might, uh, how this disease might affect them across their lifespan, whether other tissues are going to manifest with problems. Um, so, you know, it's obviously really important to understand the, the role of SMN protein in different tissues and, and at different times. Um, and we're also aware that the timing of treatment is really important um, and that a lot of these, you know, although the children treated symptomatically have done brilliantly, a lot of the children who are treated symptomatically have already lost a lot of anterior horn cells. And while they achieve stability, they're not getting huge gains. And we are looking, you know, there are trials looking at, at, at complementary treatments, combination therapies that might uh, address other defects. So next slide. Please, just to let you know, it's 25 past. So I'm not sure if you have many slides left, but just oh, so we okay. have time for discussion. OK, 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 I'll speed up. So, um, OK, so this is just um, this is a sort of recent another recent paper uh, 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 looking at the concept of, of a programming. So move to the next. Oh, sorry, just yeah, so just um, on the, on this slide, just just to point out that um, we can we have we have increasingly we have biomarkers that allow us to detect what's happening to the anterior horn cells, even in presymptomatic children. So uh, NFL uh, phosphorylated neurofilament levels, which are a marker of axonal degeneration, we know they're very high in presymptomatic SMA1 patients, so we know that you know that's a marker that their their anterior their axons are dying, their nerve cells are dying even before they're symptomatic, and also um, CMAP compound muscle gap potentials and um, Muni, which is uh, a motor unit number estimation, which are electrophysiological tests. We can we can see that even before the children have any clinical manifestations, the, these are decreased with high NFL levels. Next slide. And there's, there's this concept now of, of a, of a pre-symptomatic and a symptomatic phase um, where, 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 whereby within the pre-symptomatic phase is a clinically silent uh, phase and then a prodromal phase when probably, possibly a, a very experienced lesion might pick up a mild, mild uh, problem and then a, a conversion to a clinically manifest phase. Next slide. So I'm going to whiz through the last ones. Um, yeah, so we kind of know, we, we know that these pre-symptomatic babies have a reduced pool of motor neurons because we know that their NFL and their munis are reduced. They might look normal, but they're at risk of developing muscle fatigue, weakness, motor impairment later in life. At some point when they you know, tip over, um, become prodromal on the pool of motor neurons is, is reduced and then a threshold is reached where they become weak. So finding an optimal uh, window of time uh, following birth before significant motor neurons are lost is, is kind of key. 
Next slide. So we have new phenotypes on treatment. And we now we have children with different ages of symptom onset and diagnosis. They've received different treatments. They have different levels of need and access to therapy. We have children who a treated type one child will not look like a type one child anymore, but they might not even look like a type two child. They have their own phenotypes, really. So there's, there's, there's a lot to, to navigate uh, for, you know, for the treating teams and for the families. Next slide. And really importantly, you know, treating these children when they're already very symptomatic is, is, not, uh, is, is, is not, not the ideal way to go. And many countries are now screening. Ukraine, most of the US, about 50% of Europe are now screening at birth. So they, with the, with the Guthrie heel, heel prick test, they're looking at, at, at exon 7 deletions and, and SMN2 uh, copy number. Um, Belgium have been uh, screening since 2018 and have a lot of data. And um, one thing that they've picked up is that, of course, the type 1A patients, as as as, as you predict, because they present before 15 days of age, even on newborn screen, they're already symptomatic. So, you know, th there's a real pressure to get these treatments in early. We're pi there are some pilots of screening in the UK at the moment, and it's likely that we'll start screening nationally next year. Um, but but you know families do need to understand that um, particularly children with S two, two copies of SMN two they are likely even you know they're likely to have had some even prenatal onset of the disease even if they're not clearly symptomatic or very minimally symptomatic then then they're, they're not necessarily going to have a normal outcome because they've already lost antihuron cells. Next slide. So that's just this is just to um, just to give a sense of, of other treatments that are being developed. Uh, next slide, the combination therapies. So at the moment, there are three trials of myostatin inhibition. So this is a, a negative regulator of muscle gro growth and blocking myostatin increases muscle size and function. So there are three trials at the moment in children, some of children who've been um, previously developed, treated with or are, are currently being treated with Rizdaplam um, or um, uh, uh, or have had Rizdaplam uh, or Nusinersin um, and also a trial in children who've had uh, any of the three, including Zorgensma. So that, this is the hope that these children who've not had a great outcome, they're stable following the disease uh, treatment, but are not, um, you know, still got quite a lot of weakness. The uh, the aim is to see if we can uh, uh, get their muscles bulked up and working better with myostatin inhibition. And then next slide. And that's just a, that's just a, 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 just a schema of the current trials uh, which include you know the higher dose of mucinersin and um, there's an cloud of interfecal zongensma and then these you know these combination trials okay so uh, that, that's thank fact, you so much that was such an interesting talk and it's really inspiring to see the really dramatic impact of these ther therapies on children who've received them i'm just going to encourage people so if people are able to stay around for a couple of questions then please do because obviously if people have to drop off then we understand um so please pop your questions in the q a box while people are typing them in i just wondered if i could kick us off by just asking you, you very briefly touched on this but do you think these therapies are likely to have an impact on morbidity and mortality in the later onset types of SMA? Yeah, yes. So, the, I mean, the, you know, the, the their adults are being treated, uh, older children and adults are being treated, yes. And, uh, you know, there are some that gain skills. Um, most will not lose skills. So stability, as, as I mentioned, is really important, you know, for, for, and, and um, you know, some some will gain skills, uh, motor skills that we can detect on on something like the MFM. Others will have small gains that are not detectable on the measures we have, but will be clinically meaningful. The, the child will be able to, or the adult will be able to, you know, open a jar, lift a something, you know, up higher than they could do. So that they'll 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 be able to, um, and often they have a bit, they have more stamina. Um, so yes, across the board, you know, there are there are most people get stability plus a, maybe a small benefit. So yeah, a lot, a lot of uh, older children and adults are treated now, thousands you know, around the world. But they, but you know, the, 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 obviously the most benefit is for the babies, particularly if they're treated early. Thank you. I'm going to read out another question in a moment, but just while I do, just to remind attendees, there's the QR code on the screen or also in the Q&A box, there is a link that you can that you can go to for evaluation where we'd really appreciate your, your feedback and it also gives you the opportunity for a CPD attendance certificate. 
Um, so the next question is from Professor Kate Tatton Brown, who's just asking about the health economics of the treatment. So she's wondering if you have any evidence about the how much the therapies are saving um, compared to the interventions and support that would be needed for children affected with SMA. Yeah, I haven't got any figures at my fingertips, but um, but um, I mean the children that are treated early and or have a good response at any age, you know, clearly they're going to have much lesser health needs and, you know, much lesser therapy needs and, uh, you know, live independent lives or, you know, so so um, I think that I think the problem is with the children who are um, who are being treated, the SMA ones who are being treated late because actually they're surviving. And of course, you can't really put a cost on on that, you know, they're surviving, but often with a huge amount of disability, um, the children that are treated late, and, uh, which is why we need to screen because treating it, waiting until a child's already six months age and has lost 95% of their anterior horn cells and then rescuing 5%, it, you know, will keep them alive. It'll, um, it'll stabilize out their respiratory function and they, you know, they might need NIV, but that, that they'll, if they're, you know, they, they will remain alive, but they will probably not feed orally and they might not achieve head control or sitting. Uh, some do, um, but not all do. But um, if they didn't have the treatment, they would have they would have died or well, they would die. So that that's a diff you know, that that's what, what cost you put on that. It is difficult, I think. And I think um, because a lot of these children are now, you know, surviving with a, se a severe amount of disability and they would have previously died. So um, uh, you know, it's a no brainer to screen and it's, it's a shame we're taking so long to do it. But I, I know they're very kind of strict um, pathways in the UK for getting screening. The, the, the um, Lawrence Reve is the um, is he's a the, uh, professor of uh, neuromuscular in Oxford now, but he was in Belgium and he, he, he still he set up the trials in Belgium and newborn screening in Belgium. And he's really frustrated that, you know, the children he were treated and, and diagnosed in Belgium, you know, since 2018, they've been diagnosed at birth and they've been treated, whereas we're waiting till, you know, because obviously often they're quite advanced when they present um, because, you know, because they've been, people haven't realised, I, I saw one last week and the parents just hadn't, they came for an incidental thing and someone just called me to say they're a bit worried about them. They came for an echo and that they, they'd been worried for three months, but I don't know, they just, hadn't got their act together to go and ask anybody for help. In fact, she's quite much, she's a type 1C, so hopefully she'll do. She's having gene, she had angina therapy this week, actually. She had it yesterday or the day before. But, um, you know, this, picking these cases up, if we're not screening, they inevitably are going to be treating them late. And I think it is a, is a bit depressing because these are very, very expensive treatments. Um, yeah. The next so question think, actually really fits nicely with that. So from Sarah Stanley, who's asking, how quickly does treatment usually start once the ge genetic diagnosis has been made? Um, pretty quickly, yeah. Um, you know, within a couple of weeks. So, so the videos I was going to show you actually, one was the ba this this baby we just saw. Uh, we saw him her, her rather, I think three weeks ago. She just was in having a routine echo, and we saw her and realised it was SMA and. Got the gene back within a week. Um, she was, you know, then screened with AAV9 antibodies and liver function, and she's um, had her gene therapy this week. So it was three weeks from being seen to, and then it can be quicker than that. Um, wow, that's amazing. And that's it needs to be because there's no point in giving someone, you know, nearly two, two million pounds worth of gene mm. therapy if you, if you made them wait three months while you wait. But it is beholden on clinicians to see these kids promptly. You know, with, when they rang me from cardiology, I just said, look, just send them down. But there's no point in, there's no point in them waiting a week to see me. I may as well just see them now because if there's any if there's any risk, that's what they've got. The sooner we see them, the sooner, it's, 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 there's no point in um, holding up mm. these kids. And the other but the other baby. So you're saying how soon do they work? No, so so you're saying how soon do we treat it? Yeah, so the, the other baby I was going to show you actually was was a type one A, who's a little boy who um, he had um, cardiac congenital cardiac disease to picked up on on day two of life. He was dusky, and post op was found to be floppy. So he was a week old, or and and uh, and um, you know was was found to be floppy. So he had SMA, you know, diagnosed at like ten days, well, you know, suspected at about ten days of age. In fact, because he'd had cardiac surgery, they weren't very keen to give him gene therapy immediately. So he had Nusinus in like three days later. Because <laughs> Nusinus, you know, he, Nusinus and there's no real build up to, whereas, whereas gene therapy, you do need to check their antibodies. And, you know, there's a, it, it is, a, it is, does have some toxicity. Nusinus really doesn't. So he had, he was loaded with Nusinus in 
uh, you know, a few days after the gene came back. And then when, once he'd been loaded and everything was stable and they were happy that his cardiac enzymes were normal and he wasn't, you know, at risk from a, giving him a massive dose of this virus, he then had gene therapy. But having said that, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's got, his respiratory effort is much better, but he's not really got head, he's got a bit of head control. He's, he's not going to have a brilliant outcome. He's going to survive and uh, survive quite well, but he's not going to have a great motor outcome. But then he was very severe. And even if we detect him at birth, you know, he, he was picked up at eight or 10 days anyway, even if we, you know, would have screening, he would have taken that long, wouldn't it? By the time they'd taken the blood and sent to the lab and got it, it's going to be a couple of weeks, isn't it? So, um, so I think, you know, he, he's had the best outcome he could have done. He's, um, but it's not, you know, considering he's been loaded with nurse and had, had gene therapy, it's a bit sad that, anyway well it's not I mean it's great he's going to survive and his parents are very happy so yeah then the next question as well follows on nicely from that so um someone's asking if there's any prospects of prenatal treatment in yeah. utero um pass <laughs> I'm not sure uh, I I think um I mean at the moment we, we you know would we screen for SMA when we do down screening I mean, these are, these are these become, I guess, this, uh, sort of quite ethical questions, don't they? How much we screen? There are lots of things we could screen for in utero, aren't there? Um, <laughs> but I, I don't think anyone's working at the moment on any 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 treatments that that uh, would potentially be given um, antenatally. I'm not aware of anything. Yeah. OK, and the next question is, what are your thoughts regarding um, prenatal genetic testing versus treatment for families where parents are known carriers. So perhaps if there's already been an affected child. Yeah, yeah. No, no, they should definitely. Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah, yes, definitely. If you know that you can test the baby, if you know that the baby's at risk and tested prenatally, then you can be ready to give the gene therapy the you know, the day after they're born. <laughs> so, yes, it would be a really good idea. And, you know, I, where I work, we have a very high rate of consanguinity, actually. So, um, you know, that's partly why we have quite a high rate of, well, to be fair, actually, the kids that we've diagnosed haven't been from consanguinous families, actually. But in theory, we, we were at higher, you know, areas where there's high consanguinity, obviously, at higher risk of, of diseases like SMA. So, um, I mean, there again, there are lots of recessities, aren't there, that we could be screening. We could be screening parents to be carriers for. And it does get, uh, they do sort of stray into sort of ethical territory, don't we, or as to um, how much we screen and what we do with that that information. And But yes, uh, definitely. I mean, I, I think it's, if you, yes. you've got, if you, if you know, you know, if you know your carriers and uh, then it would make complete sense to test the fetus and, uh, you know, be ready to treat. I mean, actually, I got asked by a medical student the other day whether, um, whether it would be ethical for parents to terminate if they knew they, now that we have treatments, whether it would be ethical for parents to terminate uh, a fetus known to be affected which I kind of passed on because I kind of said well, we, the moment we don't test fetuses. But but if we were to test fetuses, I, I, I guess, I, I, you know, that would be an ethical dilemma, wouldn't it? Whether parents would be allowed then to terminate or whether we'd say you can't because we've got a treatment. Yeah, <laughs> These are big ethical questions coming out. So we'll just end on one question, if we could just briefly answer this um, for the last question. Um, so the last question is, who decides which treatment or drug the baby will get? Yeah, so there's a committee, um, an, an, an MDT committee that um, that looks at the cases. I mean, ba but yeah, basically. So, um, I mean, at the moment, you know, the babies can't have risk of anyway until they're two months old. But if they're not suitable for, for gene therapy for whatever reason, a many will get started on Ristaplam if once they're two months old because actually it does look it looks to be you know the trials are very very similar really they look they look all to be pretty equally efficacious really and nucinus is such a you know such a problem to have to give repeated lumbar punctures um but if they're um you know the, the my baby that had the congenital heart disease he couldn't have Ristaplam because he wasn't two months old so he had to have nucinus in um, but most babies are getting gene therapy so that, you know, unless there's a reason to delay it and they might get risk of and this and while they wait for the gene therapy, most will get gene therapy now at most under six months old. And over that, um, then it's a discussion often with the families as to, um, you know, most people I think now would take Ristaplam, Nucinus, and because we, that's what we had first, a lot are on Nucinus and a lot don't want to swap because they're, they're on it and it seems to be working and they don't want to risk coming off it. And some families or patients like knowing they just have one off four month treatment and then they can not think about it for four months instead of having to remember every day to take 
medicine. <laughs> but I, I think increasingly we probably will swap over to Blister Plan because, you know, it, it's, it's so much less arduous. And, you know, the data seems to be, you know, say very similar efficacy for all three drugs. I mean, the other thing with gene therapies, we don't know what will happen long term. We, we, we assume that the you know, that the anterior horses will keep on churning out SMN protein forever, but we don't know that. <laughs> we don't know whether the children go, oh, and of course they won't be able to have it again because they'll have antibodies. So if they start to, you know, if it's start, if in 10 years time or something, they start to, 20 years time, whatever, they start to, um, you know, not, the, the, not, not it's, it starts to lose its efficacy, we won't be able to, they'll have to have another treatment. Thank you so much, Dr Hartley, for a really interesting talk and a huge virtual round of applause. Just a final note to all attendees, please, please do fill out the evaluation using either the QR code or the link in the chat. And thank you so much for joining us today. We hope that we'll see you at future Linkage webinar events. Um, so thank you all very much.